Good morning, everyone. Great to be together. There is more power for today. We've been sharing on power for healing a couple of weeks ago, and last Sunday we talked about power of being free in Christ. And uh, we want to finish this short series uh, because it's the day of Pentecost and I want to focus on the mighty baptism of the Holy Spirit and the ability to be able to pray and talk to God in our special spiritual prayer language that he gives to all those who reach out to him to receive this experience. Um, On the day of Pentecost, how many years ago was that? 2,000 years ago almost, uh, Peter preaches to thousands of people. You can read it in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 1 and 2 starts with the day of Pentecost, a special commemoration. There were thousands of people that had come from the whole of the Near Eastern world, Jews, Greek Jews, Parthian Jews, Iraqi Jews, um, from Morocco, from Greece, from Italy. They come every year to the Passover festival. So these are not ethnically Jewish people. Uh, These are people from different races that are Jewish in their belief structure and they come to worship, uh, not Christ, they come to worship in in, in the Jewish way for the Passover feast and they stay over through to the day of Pentecost, 50 days afterwards. And so they happen to be in Jerusalem at the special time where Jesus has just He's been crucified for the sins of the world, buried, rose again, walked among us, and people touched him, saw him. It's recorded in the scriptures. And then he goes to heaven and he he promises them, saying, look, I'm going to come back to you. And people think some of those promises have to do with the second coming, but they actually have to do with the coming of the Holy Spirit. So if you read John chapter 14, 15, 16, 17, he says, I'll come to you again. He's actually saying, I'm going to come in the person of the Holy Spirit. You want me with you physically, you can't have me physically. I'm only here for a short period of time. But I'm going to come again, the Holy Spirit, the third person of the God is going to come. And now, you're not just going to have God with you, God's going to come and live in you, in your body. God's not interested in living in temples and tents. He wants to live in human bodies. And now the fullness of God through the Spirit can come within you without any restrictions because the sin issue has been dealt with by his death on a cross. The barriers that separated us, our imperfection from God's perfection, have been removed. That's why when Jesus died, the temple curtain was torn in half because that impassable barrier that only the high priest could go in once a year has now been removed, that you and I, all of us, can enter into God's presence and receive all that he has made available for us. So the cross of Christ provides the doorway by which the Spirit of God can come and without restriction live in us and empower us. And this is a new era. This is the era of of the Spirit, the era of grace, the era of free grace. And so the day of Pentecost as the book of Acts starts, is a very significant event, and we celebrate it today. We are an evangelical, Pentecostal, charismatic church that believes that what happened on the day of Pentecost can happen today and does happen today in churches and communities right throughout the world. And so these people that were gathered there, they came to worship the Jewish way. And so they're at the temple, and there are 120 Christ followers Some of them are confused. Some of them are uncertain. Jesus has appeared to them. They're struggling. Then he ascends and goes to heaven and says, guys, you've got to stay in Jerusalem. You stay there until the Spirit comes in his fullness and he'll inhabit you. So start to pray. So they're praying for 10 days. And so I don't know how you pray straight for 10 days. I reckon they had to have some breakfast and lunch and tea and sleep. And and so they, they came together. They're praying and seeking God, saying, we we want, God, we want everything you've got to offer. We don't fully understand what what Jesus is talking about, but we now know that he died for the sins of the world, and now there's no restriction between you and us, so we want whatever you've got to offer, 
We're ready to receive. And so they're on their knees, they're on their faces saying, give us everything you've got to offer. And so they're praying and singing. Even Jesus' mum, Mary, is there. Isn't it interesting? She gives birth to the Son of God, and now she's on her face seeking the Son of God for the fullness of his spirit. So even she says, I want more of Jesus in my life. How's that? I want more of God in my life. Whatever Jesus you've got to offer, I'm available, and I'm your mum. So if it was good enough for Mary, it should be good enough for us, eh? To be on our faces saying, hey, I want a personal Pentecost like she received. She's a pretty spiritual person, but she wanted more of God. And so anyway, the Spirit comes with great power, and we'll read about it in a few moments. And these people get flabbergasted, all the thousands of people. Because what they hear is incredible commotion, that these 120 spill out from from this event that took place, the Spirit comes upon them and, and that they just start to worship God, start to praise God and they start to speak in languages they've never learned before. Now this is a double miracle. It was the gift of being able to, to speak in tongues in new languages but this time the languages were understood. And so the, people who didn't know a word of of Farsi are speaking Farsi. Didn't know a word of, say, uh, Latin are speaking Latin. And out they come, and it's beautiful, beautiful statements of prayer and they're praising God. Well, the 3,000 people that are from all over the world, they're going, hey, I understand what he's saying. He's, it's like Darren, we know, he's from, he's from Ethiopia. He can't speak Latin. How come he's... And speaking the beautiful praises of God in languages they understood. They were flabbergasted. They were going, what the heck is going on here? So it's a double miracle. The languages were understood. It's never happened before in the book of Acts. Whenever the gift of tongues manifests itself, uh, it's not understood. And so you can read in Acts chapter 8, Acts chapter 10, Acts chapter 9, 10 and 19. Uh, in uh, Samaria with Paul, in Caesarea and in Ephesus, when the Spirit comes, there's always speaking in tongues and prophesying, but it's not understood, only in Acts 2. So it's a unique miracle. It does happen from time to time. Um, In Papua New Guinea, we know of situations where, particularly in the earlier days, when people are getting baptised in the Holy Spirit, and uh, there was one guy who didn't know a word of English, and he gets baptised in the Holy Spirit, starts speaking in tongues, and he starts speaking in, in the most beautiful English language. Not just out Aussie stride, but beautiful English. And people are going, oh, what was that? And it, it, helped, it helped convince people of the reality of this experience. We had it happen at the Christian Family Centre where a young guy who didn't know a word of Italian, probably never met an Italian, gets baptised in the Holy Spirit and starts speaking fluent Italian. And the person who was there, who was Italian, only a handful of people who was Italian, understood what he was saying, and it was an intercession. It it actually unlocked this guy to get healed in Jesus. So the person who understood, and I know these two guys, one of them is still around in our church. And so it does happen from time to time, but it's not the norm. And uh, there are other examples. But on on the day of Pentecost, it was a unique miracle because God wanted to convert these thousands of people. So anyway... Um, let's read their response after Peter, st- so they say, what the heck is going on? You know, like there's a lot of commotion here. And Peter then opens his mouth and starts talking. Acts chapter 2, the very first sermon of the Christian era. This is now in response to them saying, what does this gift of the Spirit and speaking in new languages all about? And you would think Peter would then focus on, well, let me tell you about speaking in tongues. No, And that's one of the accusations against Pentecostals, is all they do is talk about speaking in tongues. No, no, actually all that we do is we talk about Jesus, because he's the saviour, he's the baptiser in the Holy Spirit. And so Peter gives this amazing message about Jesus being the source of all God's blessings, salvation, healing, prophetic insight, and this gift. And so he shares about the wonder of who Jesus Christ is. He quotes from Psalms, he quotes from Joel, and he brings their attention to Jesus. And then at the end, this is their response in verse 37. It's it's, it's from verse 14 to verse 36, the message. When the people heard this, Peter's great message about Jesus, they were cut to the heart. In other words, great conviction comes on them and said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? What should we do about this? Uh, what, what's the normal response? And Peter says, guys, 
The one, two, three of the salvation process. He goes, you've got to repent. You've got to turn to God with all your heart. You've got to humble yourself, change your mindset, turn from him and put your trust, turn from sin and put your trust in him. And be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Water baptism, he says, is important. Because that, that, that's where you're going to publicly affirm that now Jesus is your master and Lord. Water baptism doesn't save you. It's a symbol of what has taken place. It's a public act of, of, of a private personal commitment. Then he goes, and then you will receive. You will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for everyone who is here today at the Christian Family Centre. That's what it says. For the Christian Family Centre people who are far off. All who are far off. This promise is for you. This promise is for every single person on planet Earth. For all whom the Lord our God will call. Has God called you to salvation in Christ? If he has called you to come to know him, then this promise is for you. If you haven't received it, you can receive. You can receive today by faith. You can experience this wonder of a new prayer language today or tomorrow or go for a walk down the beach today and break through in the language if you've never spoken it. You can receive. The promise is for you. You can say, how can you say that? How do you know I'll receive? Because the word says that. The promise is for you. If you want it, if you call out to Jesus, you want everything he has to offer, salvation, baptism in the spirit, he will come through for you if you come with earnest desire and, and, and a believing heart where you're believing and you're trusting him. So the big three, the essential experiences mentioned in this verse, the first and most important is to be born of the spirit. And folks, this is above water baptism and above even the baptism in the spirit and the gift of speaking in other tongues. People say, oh, do you belong to the groups that say, unless you're baptized in water and baptized in the Holy Spirit and speak in this new prayer language, you're not a Christian? No, that's ridiculous. That's heresy. We believe that number one above anything else is to be born of the Spirit, to be reborn by the power of God to change our hearts. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. And that's salvation by grace through faith alone. You can't add to it. So water baptism, we've got a baptistry here, is important, but it's not as important as being saved. People say, oh, water baptism, Pastor Bill, if people don't get baptised in water, they're not Christians. And some say, if you're not baptised in the Holy Spirit and speak in this new planet, you're not a Christian. That's ridiculous. And I can prove it to you with one story. Proof 100%. You can say, how can you say that? The thief on the cross. Did he get saved that day or didn't he get saved? Jesus says, today, mate, you're in paradise because you've affirmed your faith in me. You've turned from your sinfulness and put your trust in me. You are saved by grace through faith. He didn't say, now, man, you better make an appointment with Pastor Phil. Get off that cross somehow. Get Pastor Alan. He's a mechanic, you know, kind of engineer, he'll get you off the cross, see pastor, he'll baptise you more, then, then see pastor Tim, he'll get you baptised in the Holy Spirit, then get back on the cross somehow and you'll be saved. He didn't say that, obviously. Salvation came to that man on that day. Now is the time, today is the day of salvation. And so salvation is number one. In my own experience, I have to say, out of all of my experiences in God, and I've had many and varied amazing, miraculous guidances and, and provisions from God. I have to say, my born-again experience as a 17-year-old kid stands out as number one. Number one, two, three. I'm not saying that that or the others. I want that and everything else that God's got to offer. But if I have to come down to the irreducible minimum, it's knowing Jesus as my saviour, experiencing his presence and power. That can only come through the Holy Spirit. He is the one that draws you to him. You can't become a Christian by your own volition. You can't say, oh, I'll choose to become a Christian today. It's the Holy Spirit who draws you, who opens your heart, who helps you to see your sin so that you can turn from it and repent and put your trust in Jesus Christ. Salvation is all of God's grace. And this has to be number one, the born again experience. Does anyone agree with me? Can I hear an amen? Amen. Yeah, it's true. And you can send this to, to people who believe the other and tell them this is what our pastor believes and what he's saying is true. 
Don't get the amen to that. Okay. <laughs> Secondly, to be baptized in water. Look, I don't want to minimize water baptism. When a person has been genuinely reborn by the power of God and they come to personally and intimately know Jesus, they naturally, hear me on this, they naturally want to be submitted to him and obey him. It's not a forced thing. If you really know him and you come to love him and appreciate his love for you, you will naturally want to submit to him and obey him. And I tell you, I'm so glad I have a master over me who is my leader. I have an authority over me. Because if I was my own authority, I probably would have been married and divorced three or four times. If they wanted me. They probably wouldn't have after the second time. I probably would still be smoking marijuana, getting drunk, kind of playing sport and not just wasting my life. Heading the wrong way. Addicted, bound. That's what I was as a teenager. And, um, and so I'm so glad that Jesus found me, saved me, and because he's the safest person in the universe, I can safely submit to him and obey him. And the very first act of, of obedience, a public act of obedience, is water baptism. And it is important. It's important. A person who says, well, I'm a Christian, but I don't want to be baptised in water. Well, I just say, yeah, you're a Christian, but you're a disobedient Christian. <laughs> you're not submitted to Jesus. And I've had all the arguments in the world, people say to me, why they shouldn't be baptised in water. And uh, I myself, I was christened as a baby in the Greek Orthodox Church. And uh, my mum and dad, they did the right thing according to their tradition. So I was done and I was fully immersed. Like, you know, in the Orthodox tradition, you can stick the baby <laughs> under. And if any part of the hair doesn't go under, eh, the priest sometimes, you see some videos of someone, in they go, in they go, in the father, the son, the other, kids are crying their eyes out, they anoint them with oil. And, and you think, oh, <laughs> they really believe. They know what the Greek word baptismo means. It means put under. None of the sprinkling stuff. So I was done properly, okay? And so when I became a born-again Christian, I didn't negate what my mum and dad did. I didn't go, oh, you did the right... I think they did the right thing according to the knowledge that they had at the time of understanding. They wanted me... The only thing I disagreed is they thought that made me a Christian. And I said, no, I don't think so. Because I'm a pagan. I said, Mum and Dad, this is what I've been up to. They said, you have been? I said, yeah. I'm a sinner. <laughs> I've been lying, stealing, lusting, doing the wrong thing. And, and, and oh, you have? Said, yeah, I'm not a good boy. I've been a naughty boy. I've been a naughty Greek boy. I've taken you for granted. And now I've given my life. And when they heard me confessing my sins, they couldn't believe it. They thought I was an angel. All Greek parents think their little boys are angels, but they're not. <laughs> and so, when I got saved, the first thing is I wanted to, to get baptised in water. I had a problem. My mum didn't want me to. So she was pretty anti. Then she came to Christ and so did my dad. I let him, so I thought, what do I do? I want to obey Jesus. I'm 17. I want to get baptised in water. And, and I didn't really pray about it. I just, this idea came into my head. I thought, oh, I've got to, I love my mum. I love her more now that I'm saved. I even did housework, made my bed, cleaned the kitchen. She, couldn't, she actually took my temperature one day. She said, are you okay? What is wrong with you? <laughs> and anyway, so I came up with this idea. Two months' time, I'll be 18. Government says I can actually go to Vietnam and I can be conscripted. That was 19, you know, like I think... Well, I'm an adult. I'm an adult. I can make my own choices. So, Jesus, just hang in there for another two months, please. I want to obey you, but I love my mum. I don't want to cause unnecessarily difficulty. So, I got baptised in water, I think, two days after I turned 18. Never told my mum for a few years later. She didn't ask me. I didn't lie. And when I told her, she goes, what? I said, and then she understood. So, so water baptism is important. It's an act of obedience, the first of many and uh, look what Jesus said. Look what Jesus says. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all, baptizing them 
in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey. See, baptism is the first act of obedience. So if you don't get baptized, if you say, well, I don't want to get baptized in water and don't submit to Christ, then you probably won't want to submit to some of the other commands of Scripture. And we're under orders. If you're a Christ follower, we're under Jesus. There are certain things we don't say and do. We live a life of obedience to him, trusting him to keep us from sin and from violating the law of love with our, with our neighbour and our brothers and sisters. <laughs> so, and again, you know, like people who say, oh, the thief on the cross story, that negates people who say, you've got to have the three to be saved. Well, because I don't, I don't need to be baptised. Well, you know, I, I'd say, look, I don't argue with people anymore. I used to argue with them. I just say, well, you better go and talk to Jesus about this. Because he says, you've got to do it. So, therefore, just at least be honest. Say, I'm, I, want, I want to disobey him. Just say you're a disobedient Christian. And therefore, you're going to miss out on blessings. Simple as that. But secondly, how do you argue with Jesus who when he was 30 years of age and he was done by his parents when he's a bubby and at 30 years of age he says, I want to get baptised in water by immersion and he'd never sinned and he was the son of God. Me, I was a sinner and a child of the devil really in the way I was living. He's the son of God, never sinned. He says, I want to get baptized. John the Baptist goes, whoa, no. You're the lamb of God that's going to take away the sin of the Lord. You know what, John, what Jesus said? John, just do it. It's the right thing to do. So he got baptized in water. Argue that one out with him. Whatever excuse you have to say, I don't want to get baptized in water, that one king hits you. You should go back and say, he did it himself. And then he says, now you do it as a sign of obedience and obey me for the rest of your life. Wow, that's, that's the gospel. So water baptism is important, very important, not essential for salvation. To be baptised with the Holy Spirit is the third one of this promise that uh, uh, we, we have read and we will read again in Acts chapter 2. Did we read this scripture? Repent and be baptised. And you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Well, to be baptised in the Holy Spirit. Um, look at his final words. Again, Jesus gives the Great Commission. But he, he reinforces it. So Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, the final chapter, he gives the Great Commission, talks about what we should do. Go out, share about him, baptise people, get them, you know, kind of minister to them in his name until he returns. But then his final word to his followers, he says, look guys, John baptised you with water, but in a few days you'll be baptised with the Holy Spirit. In other words, the Holy Spirit's, he's around. You can't be a Christian, you can't be a Christ follower, but you can actually get immersed in him. The same word is used, baptism. So this is actually now getting fully immersed in the Spirit, with the Spirit. In other words, him overwhelming every part of your life. God wants to come and live in you and be in control of your heart and your life. Then in verse 8, he says, but you will receive power when the Spirit comes on you. And this power is to enable you to be effective witnesses of Jesus wherever you are. And it's to empower our lives, to help us live the Christian life, and it's to enable our witness to be able to, to continuously give an effective credible witness of who Jesus is with the people in our world. Now, on the day of Pentecost, this is what happened. This is the experience. Now, Luke, he writes this, but he wasn't there. So he researched it probably 25 years after the events. He's talking to Mary, who's an old woman now. He's talking to the disciples. Well, what was it like when the Spirit came on that day? And so he, as a historian, he's listening to all these stories, and he says, well, have you put it down? It's, an, it's a wonderful story, how he records it. And he says, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind. Now, folks, read that and think, for the Spirit to come, there's got to be a tornado that comes into the room. No. It's not a literal, physical wind that turned everything upside down. It seemed to them so suddenly, so powerfully, and Luke, of course, thinks, oh, wind, 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 that's, that's power. That's an Old Testament symbol of power. So he's deliberate in his writing, saying, now they're receiving power. Suddenly, the Spirit comes upon them. 
and, and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. Now, as Luke's trying to understand what the heck are they talking about, he didn't see little Bunsen burners on top of their head, like you see pictures, you know, it's like, he's trying to somehow explain well, what was happening. And they're probably going, you know what, I don't know what happened, but I was flat on my back and I was, so I was so hot, it was like, whoa, heat was going right through me. Others were going, I'm on my face, and it was so sudden, I just start speaking in this language. And so fire is a symbol of holiness in the Old Testament, purification. When I received this experience, I literally felt the heat. I don't know whether it was my own physiological response or what, but four o'clock in the morning, in my bed, lying there as I'm receiving, it was like heat came from the top. Like I felt it going right through me. What's that? Right through to my feet. And I, and I start to speak in this new prayer language, and I'm heating up. And I did not know what that was about. To me, I think it was an infusion of power because from then on, the addictive patterns in my life started breaking. The word started working. And God started then use me in a few weeks' time to lead a revival in the high school. The only thing that still hung on was cigarette smoking. I was addicted from 11 years of age till 18. I'm, I'm, I'm a, a pack at a day person. My lungs are ruined. I had pneumonia. I mean, I'm sick. I'm coughing and spluttering, and it took years. So at 18 years of age, after that, I received enough power to actually break that addiction. And I found the nicotine addiction was stronger than the uh, marijuana addiction. In fact, the marijuana was more a dependency, a psychological thing, because you're with friends. And, uh, but the nicotine addiction was vicious, and it took a hold of me, and I couldn't break. It was physical and, and uh, strong urges, and particularly after I had a meal. Give me a fag. You know, like just, you know, it took me even a year afterwards, I'd, I'd be, after food, mm, I, smell, I smell nicotine, oh, you like the physiological response is give me more. But I had the power to break it. So people think nicotine addiction is not strong, it's one of the worst addictions, that and alcohol addiction. So, um, so I got baptised in the Holy Spirit with power and it was part of the transforming experience of, in my life. I could see it in the physical dimensions of overcoming things and then empowering me to be a witness in the school. So they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire, symbols of holiness, separated and came to rest on each of them. And look at this. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Notice that. The Holy Spirit didn't do the speaking for them. Jesus filled them with the Holy Spirit. They did the speaking in these precious languages. God didn't force them to speak, didn't force them to pray in this language. It naturally happened as they're yielding control to Him, their 10 days of prayer. And then the Spirit starts to engage with their spirit and they start to speak in these new languages. And... Uh, a wonderful experience. But it can be scary for some people, and, and some people mystify it, like they get really spooky about it, get a bit mystical and super spiritual. And that happened to me. I'm 18, and, and I want to receive this experience. So, so I go for prayer, and look, they weren't young people that prayed for me. They were older people. But they just weren't trained properly. And they didn't do it right. So it was a big turn off. Three times I was prayed for. And these old boys, they were full of zeal, but they didn't have a lot of brains, you know, like just, they were enthusiastic, but there wasn't a lot of common sense. I still remember one guy, he said, okay, Bill, you want to receive? I said, yeah. Anything God's got to offer, <laughs> he grabs my head and starts shaking me. <laughs> and I feel like I'm just thinking, what is going on? I'm just getting a headache, instant headache. Like, and, he's, and he's trying to assist Jesus by doing something physical. And I thought, that turned me off. So I just thought, and I liked him. He's a nice guy, but really. Then I went, no, the second time, this one was worse. And this guy was a really big guy, been around for a long time, and he was very serious. So he's looked at me and he goes, look at me, Bill. I'm praying like this. He goes, look at me, look into my eyes. I'm like, okay. So he needed to put his face really out close to mine, like break my critical distance. And he goes, open your mouth. 
in Jesus' name, roll that tongue. And I'm going, what the heck? I didn't tell him that because I'm, you know, I'm trying to be obedient. I'm thinking, so that didn't work. I'm going, that, that's like, that's not what I read in here. It says, and the Spirit, and then they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. So I turned off a little bit. Then I thought, oh, look, I'll, I'll go one more time. So I went, this time, the upstairs room. It was the prayer room. Great little room we had. This is in the Sturt Street Church. I go to the upstairs room, and I'm sitting down. There's a group of us. So I'm getting myself ready. Okay, so, so the, the pastor who said, now, now, you'll sit around, and, and someone will come and pray with you. So I'm thinking, I'm, so this, is, this is my stance. I'm like this. I'm sitting down. My jaw was clenched in my... I'm then no one's going to shake my head and no one's going to open my mouth and it's going to be Jesus or nothing's going to happen. So I'm like this. <laughs> One of the pastors, he's a beautiful old man and he's going to be with the Lord now. And, and he just said, Bill, what are you doing? <laughs> I said, I'm getting ready to receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit. He just looked at me and said, he said, can we just talk? He says, what's been going on? I mean, what do you mean? And I told him. And he, and he just really apologised. He was a very wise pastor. He just apologised to me. He said, look, they're enthusiastic, but they need a bit more training. That's not how you receive. And, and, and he just said this word to me. He goes, Bill, you're going to receive the same way you receive Christ as your saviour. He's the baptizer in the Holy Spirit. So you think about how did you receive Christ as your saviour? By faith, receiving, yielding, accepting, believing, acknowledging, and then I experienced the wonder of forgiveness and peace with God. And, 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 and I said, is that that easy? Because yeah, it's by faith. It's a free gift. Grace, grace. You can't do anything to, to earn it. It's a free gift, and, and you receive just by faith. You, you trust him, he'll do it. In fact, and then he sowed a little seed in my head, and I think it was a prophetic, a prophetic word. He goes, in fact, he goes, you could receive tonight, just Jesus and you. I said, just Jesus and me? Yeah, gave me permission. Four o'clock in the morning. I couldn't go to sleep that night. I went to, went to bed about one o'clock. I thought, it can't be that easy. And I read the scripture again. So I'm tossing and turning until about four o'clock in the morning. And I just said, okay, Jesus, just you and me. No shaking heads. No, it, it, I'm, I want it. So I read the scripture and I just started talking to the Lord. And I just repeated to him, to Jesus in prayer, what the pastor said to me. I said, well, I know how I got saved, so I want this gift. So please give it to me. Nothing happened. Please give it to me. But something within me was saying, now, as he said to me, you yield control. Bill, you don't lose control of your mind. Never forgot this. I've always said this. People think speaking in tongues, I lose control of my mind and I become in a trance-like state like a zombie but, well, if it's a trance-like state, it's a cult, and you shouldn't belong to it. We're not talking about cultic, esoteric kind of practices. We're talking about yielding control of your vocal cords, your speech, to enable the spirit to speak, but you never lose control of your mind. You think about, gee, I'm, I'm speaking in tongues as I'm driving to church this morning, and I'm obeying the road laws of South Australia. I could be speaking in tongues, and the police could go past, and I could say, hi, I'm obeying the laws, but I'm talking to Jesus in heaven. So you, don't lose, you don't go, oh, I'm speaking in tongues, so I'll drive my car like this. No, 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 that's crazy. You don't lose control of your mind. You yield control of your speech faculty to say, I'm yielding to you, I'm no longer going to control, be in control of this most unruly member of my body. The one member of your body that causes you more trouble than anything else. And you might say, ah, oh, that's not true. It's true. Your tongue and bad speech that comes out of wrong thoughts is the most terrible part of our humanity. And we say the wrong thing to the wrong person at the wrong time. And so uh, it's interesting that this one area, he says, you yield control of your speech faculty to me as a symbol to yield control of every other faculty of your being to me. If you're going to be filled with the Spirit, it means being yielded to him and letting him take control. I was out of control. I came under his control. And that's why to be filled with the Holy Spirit is not losing control. It's actually coming under his control. 
I was out of control, but I come under Jesus' control and allow the Spirit to dominate my life with his love and kindness and gentleness and goodness and peace. And so yielding control of what I say is, is, is saying, you know what, I now trust you to impart this gift to me and I'm going to step out and I'm going to speak those words and expect the Holy Spirit to inspire me and to enable me to say it. That was my experience and I have shared this with many thousands of people and uh, it never fails to inspire faith for them to receive. So you can receive today. We're going to pray in a couple of minutes. You can receive out the front here today. You can receive Christ as your saviour. You could receive Christ as the baptised the Holy Spirit with this ability to speak in a new prayer language. And, um, or we pray for you. You may not come through in actually speaking in this language because it's public and, and you might be a fairly private kind of person like I am. And so it was better for me to be on my own. But we can pray for you. And I guarantee you this. If you have desire in your heart, you earnestly desire, say, you know, I really want this. And you come out the front and we lay hands on you, anoint you with oil, and we pray a believing prayer. I mean believing prayer. You will be able to speak in tongues after we pray with you. Whether it's now, or whether it's this afternoon, or whether it's this week, I guarantee you will. You will. Because God does not lie. Jesus says in Luke 11, he goes, if you, if you fathers who are evil... When you're, you, know, you might be evil, but if your kid asks you for a bit of bread or a bit of fish, you're not going to give him a stone or a snake. Even bad people give good gifts to their kids. How much more will the Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? He will give you this. When you will come through in glossolalia, being able to work, that, that's something that can happen instantly or it can happen on your own. In fact, what I would say is, if you don't receive straight away in the next couple of minutes then go for a walk down the beach if it's warm enough weather. Or go for a walk down the park. Nobody around and just say, Lord, I've been prayed for. Before we, I was prayed for, I couldn't speak in tongues. After I was prayed for, because I desire, I've asked, I believe, I can now speak in tongues. See the difference? You can. If you believe that, then as you just step out and say, okay, I'm going to start speaking it. And you might think, oh, I'm making it up. You can't make it up. You just start and the Spirit will start to engage and bang it'll take off you can be walking down the street you can be four o'clock in the morning on your bed and you will receive and you need this experience they've done experiments in bible colleges barry chant is the the, the chief experimenter with a bible college class he says for the next 30 days 10 minutes i want you to pray in the spirit using your prayer language do you know the number of miracles and supernatural events just goes in, their, in people's lives. Amazing. It's a doorway. Because it's a doorway by which you're, you're not theoretically saying, I believe in the Holy Spirit. You're saying, I am practicing the presence of God through the gift of the Spirit, and I'm using this prayer language as a means by which I want everything God's got to offer. Healing, prophetic insight. I don't want to miss out on anything God wants to do in and through me. And that's why it's such an important gift. Not as important as salvation. But he doesn't say one or the other. He says you can have the lot. Look at the scripture. Can we stand together as we read the scripture? And musicians, you come up here. Let's get ready to sing a song and, and see what the Lord does. And you will receive, notice I've underlined these words, the gift of the Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. Look at this. It's a gift, folks. A gift that comes by grace. Just like your salvation is a gift by God's grace. You can't earn it. Some people say to me, oh, I'm just not good enough. Pastor Bill, if you know the struggle I have with sin precisely you need this experience to help empower your life to be able to overcome this is part for everyone it's not i've got to reach a state of perfection beforehand Fooey. none of us are perfect we're all sinners saved by grace we need everything god god promises us to help us live the christian life it can't be earned it's not based on being good enough or worthy enough it's received if i offer you a gift 
just offer me the gift. I really want this gift. Can you please give me the gift? Pretty please. I'll do anything. Will you give me the gift? What do I have to do with the gift? She's offering it. I've got to grab the thing and say, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. That's faith. Thanking him in advance. You've got to desire it. And then have believing prayer. And believing prayer thanks God for the answer even before the evidence arises. So if we pray for you to receive, and you might say, nothing's happened. Don't, that's not true. Something has happened. You cannot pray earnest prayers, as James says, the prayer, the earnest, effectual prayer of a righteous man or woman avails much. If you desire and, and you're earnest about it, so I really want it, and believing prayer, that you believe that the answer's on the way, then you will be filled with thanksgiving to say, Lord, I thank you. If I don't get it now, I'm going to get it this afternoon or this week. Grab my little booklet on baptism in the Holy Spirit. You may need to do a little bit of reading of Scripture and, uh, and fill your mind with Scripture and the promises, but you will receive. It's a gift by grace. It's to be received by faith. It's a promise by Jesus. He says, for all, the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. And it's to be gratefully and thankfully received. Are you ready to receive today? You know, I say, hey, I hope I've demolished every excuse that you might have. God loves you. He wants the best for you. He wants to not just save you, but to set you free, to empower your life, to help you overcome, to be an effective witness of Him to those around about you. Some of you have received this gift, like an A30 service, and you need to refill it. You just say, you know what? I'm not fully utilizing it. I want to be refilled with the Spirit. We would love to pray with you as well. Maybe you, you've come here, you haven't given your life to Christ. You need to be born again. You come out the front as well. Just let one of the, the prayer team know. Say, I, I need to become born again. I need Jesus to become my Savior. That's a work of the Spirit. Or you may have come for healing or some other need. We'd love to pray with you. But what I'd like you to do is as Laura leads us in a song, I want you to come and stand out here. The prayer team come and stand behind them. I don't want anyone to pray. I want you to wait because I'd like you to come and I want you to have your hands like this. Just say, Lord, you're submitting to him and you're wanting to receive from him. And then when we anoint you with oil and lay hands upon you, that's a symbol of the Spirit and it's the hand of Jesus. At that moment, I'm going to pray one collective prayer and that's the the point of contact for your faith. If you, we're going to sing a song and we're all going to be worshipping. We're not going to be focused on what's happening here. That's when you step out and say, Lord, now I receive this gift and he will enable you to speak in a new prayer language. And we will pray with you. Before we pray, you can't. After we pray, you will because you desire, you ask, you pray and believe and you will receive. Hallelujah. Can you believe that? So let's be filled with the Spirit. We've got time in this place to worship Him. So let's all stay here, not go outside. Let's worship Him. And you need to be refilled or receive for the first time or receive Jesus as your Saviour. Come and stand out here now facing me.